Welcome to Global Community Church this morning. And we are so glad you decided to worship with us this morning. We sincerely pray that God will bless you today. If you really know Jesus, then you must live the way that he did. Good morning. I would like to begin this morning with a question. And the question is this. Do you know for sure? Do you know for sure? It's an important question. You ask, for sure what? <laughs> well, let me end up. Let me give you the rest of the story. Do you know for sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? Or is that something you would say that you are still working on? Let me follow this up with a second question. Suppose you were to die today. You approach heaven, you knocked on the door, and God asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Let me give you that second question again. Suppose you were to die today. I don't want you to die, but life is uncertain. Suppose you were to die today. You got to heaven. You knocked on heaven's door. God opened the door, looked at you, and asked you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? Ponder these questions as we turn to the text, 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 to 21. We come to the conclusion of our study on First John, and it ultimately comes down to this question, do you know for sure? Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we praise you. You are a great and a wonderful God. You have done so much for us. Most importantly, you have given us life, eternal life, and this life is in your Son. So, Father, I pray that you'd open up our hearts to your word today. Speak to our hearts for your word. Your word is truth and cause the Spirit of God to give us understanding in your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Here is what the text says. 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 to 21, the concluding portion of the book of 1 John. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have received the requests which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that we should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that one who is born of God sins, but we know who we, sorry, we know that one who is born of God sins, but we but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him is who is true. In his Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. This is the closing text of 1 John chapter 5. And uh, as we look at the text, we see he uses the word no, 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 seven times in those verses. 
He's talking about Christian certainty. He's talking about Christian assurance. And uh, as we talk about certainty in the midst of uncertain times, we talk about knowing for sure in the times where there are people are so skeptical about so many things. People are skeptical concerning their health. We are in the midst of a pandemic. And every time we think we have caught the corner on this thing, something else comes up. The Delta variant, this variant, that variant. In the midst of really uncertain times, uncertainty in the economy, we see that inflation is high. Price, you go to any stores and prices are going up everywhere. So there is much uncertainty. There is much skepticism among people. And so yet amidst this skepticism, in the midst of all these uncertainty, John talks about certainty. He talks about assurance. He talks about knowing for sure. And that's why I began the text this morning asking those two important questions. Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? I remember when someone asked me that question the first time, I said, well, you cannot know for sure that you have eternal life. And I was wrong. And I'm saying there that John says you can know for certain that you have eternal life. In fact, in verse 12 of the text, he says, um, verse 12, or verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So you can know for certain that you have eternal life. And that's why I followed up with the second question. And the second question basically says this. Suppose you were to die today. You went to heaven. You knocked on heaven's door. And God said to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you see? And that is question is basically asking, what do you think the basis of eternal life really is? I remember when I first came to the United States, when I was planning to come, I realized that, hey, you know, in order to come to the United States, there are certain basic requirements. All right? Things are kind of changed because we, right now we have open borders. You just walk in. Anybody just walk in the way they want. But I remember when I came... I was told that you need to have a passport, and in the passport, you need to have your visa, all right? So I went, and I got the basic requirements, and when I entered the United States, I was met by immigration officers. They opened up my passport. They saw that I had a visa there, and I was allowed to come in. So the basic question is, God is not going to let anybody into heaven, it's not a free for all. There is a basic requirement. And John says, he who has the Son of God has life. He who does not have the Son of God shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. I'm saying to you, my friend, today, among all the uncertainties, you need to know for sure that you have eternal life. Eternal life is a gift that God gives. It is not something that we work for. Often you ask somebody, you ask people, are you saved? Are you a child of God? Do you know for sure that you're a Christian? Do you know for sure that you have eternal life? And the people will tell you yes, and you say, on what basis? And they say, well, I am a good person. Well, I want you to understand that being good is good. Being good will protect you and make sure that you have a good name. Being good can also help you keep away from prison. But being good will not give you eternal life, for the Bible says. For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. So there, my friend... Eternal life is a choice. Becoming a Christian is a choice. 
Becoming a child of God is a choice. John chapter 1 and verse 12 says, For as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. You see, I remember when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Sure, I was growing up. I went to church. When there, there are certain times where you go to church, Easter time, Christmas time, those special occasions. And I thought that if I would just go to church, I would have done my duty. I was a good person. You see, my friend, there will be people who have gone to church. There will be people who have said, I am a good person. I have lived a good moral life. And all of that is good. But I am saying to you, it is not being a good person that gets somebody into heaven. It is not being a good person that wins us approval with God. You see, the Bible tells us that we are all sinners. We have fallen short of God's holy and righteous standard. If anyone could, be, could have gotten into heaven by being good, there would be no need for Jesus Christ to die. And scripture tells us he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus Christ came and he laid down his life, a very horrible death. He died as a substitute. He was there in our place. And the Bible says, when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's how we are saved. It's a commitment that we make turning away from a life of sin and turning to God and yielding ourselves to God so that God now becomes the boss of our lives, the master of our lives, the one who controls our life. And John says, these things I have written unto you, those who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. John wrote the Gospel of John, and the Gospel of John tells us in John chapter 20 and verse 31, John says he wrote the Gospel of John specifically so that those who want to know God can come to know him. Those who are away from God can come and experience eternal life. You will recall the most popular verse probably in the Bible is John 3.16, where it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. My friend, when you come and you open up your life to Jesus, you turn away from a life of sin and you turn to God. Something miraculous takes place. The Bible calls it regeneration. The Bible calls it being born again. Because when we come into this life, we are dead in our trespasses and in sins. If we continue on our way without God, we will spend eternity in hell in a Christless eternity. But God offers to us the gift of eternal life. And when you open up your life to him, the Holy Spirit brings about a miraculous work, a work of conversion, a work of regeneration, so that you who were once spiritually dead now become spiritually alive. You who were once away from God now have a vital relationship with God. And the Bible says when you do that, you know for sure that you have eternal eternal life. But John wrote the first epistle of John to people that were already Christians. And he wrote it so that they could have the assurance that they are indeed children of God. John says, you can know for sure. You can know that you belong to God. And throughout the text, he talk, keeps talking about knowing, knowing, knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. You can know for sure. So there in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13 to 21, he mentions seven things. That you can know for sure. You see, understand, my friend, Christianity is not about I hope so or I think so. 
It is, it is an I know so faith because of what God has revealed to us in his word. He tells us we can know God. He says we can know that we are in God. He says we can know that this is the last hour. He says we can know that we are of the truth. And John says you can know for certain that you have eternal life. So in the closing portion of this text, he mentions those certainties. So certainty number one. Certainty number one, that we possess eternal life. It is not something you hope to have. It is not something, you know, you come to the end of your life, and that's what certain people think. You come to the end of your life, and then God evaluates your life. You have bad things you have done, and you have good things you have done, and God evaluates your life. And if you have more good than bad, then God says, come into heaven. No, my friend, going to heaven is a decisive decision that is made when you open up your life and you give your life to Jesus Christ. You are saved. You now become a Christian. You see, John says, there's the certainty of eternal life. And by the way, the Bible calls it eternal life. It is not just life for a day or life for a few years. It is eternal life. In other words, when you come to have that relationship with God, it's a relationship that begins the day you open up your life to Jesus. And it's a relationship that goes on into the next life when we are finally in the presence of God. You are born again. You are a child of God. So do you know for sure that you have eternal life, the certainty of eternal life? There is another certainty that John tells us about in these verses. The certainty of answered prayer. The certainty of answered prayer. Here's what he says. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. John says, not only am I certain that I possess eternal life, but John says, I also have the certainty that when I pray, God will answer my prayer. Why? Because I am a child of God. God has obligated himself to his children. By his grace, he says, I will supply all of your needs. The certainty of answered prayer. Here's what the, what the book tells us in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. It says, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. John says, when you pray, God will answer you. But there are three basic conditions. God is not going to say yes to everything that I ask him for. But there are three conditions, he says. Number one, when I come to God asking him for stuff, we must ask according to God's will. We must ask according to God's will. It's not a matter of coming with a long laundry list. You know, so often we approach God and we say, Lord, give me this and give me that and give me this and give me that. You know, and basically it's just stuff we want for ourselves to make us feel good or to satisfy some carnal desire. But John says, and throughout the scripture, it says that when we come to pray, we must ask about God's will. We must ask according to God's will. In other words, when my will lines up with God's will, when the things I am asking for are the things for the glory and honor of God, because understand, scripture tells us that God has placed us on earth for this reason. The reason is to honor and to glorify him. Scripture says, whether therefore you eat or you drink or whatever you do, you do all for the glory of God. So I must ask according to God's will. Secondly, God obligates himself to us when we are obedient. He says we must keep God's commandments. You see, it is not just a matter of saying you are a Christian. It's a matter of living the life. 
a life of consistent obedience. You see, sometimes we obey some, you know, we obey one year, we, we obey one month, or next week we come back and we obey. No, what he's talking about is a life of consistent obedience to the command of God. I am living like a child of God. I belong to him, and so I take on his character. I take on his lifestyle. I obey. So John says, when I ask, I can get assurance of answered prayer. When I ask according to God's will. Secondly, when I keep his commandment. Thirdly, he says, when we abide in him. When we abide in him. John chapter 15 tells us, if we abide in him and he abide in us, we can ask whatever we want to. We are, when we stay connected to God, God's will becomes my will. God honor becomes my highest priority as the scripture says when we seek God with all of our hearts God is the number one of my life I am connected to him the Holy Spirit of God is leading and guiding my life I am living my life according to the dictates of the word of God then scripture says God will supply my needs God will supply my needs, the certainty of answered prayer. We must not ask for our selfish needs. We must make sure that our wills align with the will of God. Too often, what we come to God with is selfish prayers. Some preacher gave this illustration of a prayer that a young lady prayed on the day of her wedding. Here is what the prayer says. She was about to get married, and she comes with this prayer. She says, Dear God, this is my wedding day. I know I haven't been able to spend much time with you lately. With all the rush of getting ready for today, I am sorry. She says, I guess, too, that I feel a little guilty when I try to pray about all this since Larry the guy she was getting married to, still isn't a Christian. But then she says, but, oh, Father, I love him so much. What else can I do? I just couldn't give him up. Oh, you must save him. Somehow save him. You know how much I have prayed for him and the way we've discussed the gospel together. I've tried to appear not too religious. I know, but that's because I didn't want to scare him off. Yet he isn't antagonistic, and I can't understand why he hasn't responded. Oh, if he only were a Christian. That she prayed, she prayed on her wedding day, and she says to God, Dear Father, please bless our marriage. I don't want to disobey you, but I do love him and want to be his wife. So please be with us, and please don't spoil my wedding day. You can see the kind of prayer this is. This prayer is about her this prayer is about doing whatever she wants this prayer is about forgetting about what god's word says forgetting about what god's will is she has made up her mind this is what i'm going to do and this is what it is and so often we come to god and we have our own agenda and we ask god to rubber stamp our own agenda and god says no god says i want you to get on my agenda and when you are on my agenda then we are lined up. Then God says, you will ask according to my will and you will receive. Scripture says, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have asked of him. He answers us. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Seeking God's will. The great prayer warrior George Mueller said this, Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. So John says, whatever you ask according to God's will, God will give to you. And then he throws in the text here, a very strange portion, which seems that does not fit at all. Verse 16, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give for him. 
life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that you should ask for. That little verse, that verse just seemed to be out of place, but it's not because John is saying that we have the assurance of God answering our prayer when we pray according to God's will. And he says, but there is a prayer that God is not going to answer because God has made up his mind about this already. And he talks about the prayer that leads to death. And, uh, you know, Bible scholars are very divided concerning what that really is. Some agree that it is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, as recorded in, Matthew, in Mark chapter 3 and verse 20 to 30. Some others believe it's apostasy, the apostasy of unbelief, as recorded in Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 1, all the way to chapter 6 and verse 8. Others believe it's a lifestyle that leads to physical death by God's judgment. And you read, you know, different people and different scholars and they will give different answers. And to tell you the truth, it's very unclear. It's one of the most difficult texts in scripture. But what I would say, what I would believe is, you know, that sin leading to death, it may well be that he is talking about the example of Ananias and Sapphira where they blatantly, they blatantly sinned against God, sinned against the Holy Spirit, and God struck them dead. There we are also recorded, also have recorded for us in the book of 1 Corinthians, where Paul says that there were those that were coming to the Lord's table drunk and desecrating the Lord's table. And Paul says, for this reason, some have some have, many among you are weak and sick, and a number have fallen asleep. That is, they have died. But John says, pray for your brother, and pray if you pray a sin not that, if you pray that against him, if you pray for him concerning a sin not leading to death, God will answer your prayer. But if it's already foregone conclusion that God has concluded this is what's going to happen. John says, you will not, your, that prayer, particular prayer, will not be answered. So John says, talking about knowing, certainties, knowing for sure. He says, we can know for sure that we have eternal life. The certainty of having eternal life. Then John says, we can know for sure, we have the certainty that God will answer our prayer. And then thirdly, he talks about the third certainty, the third fact you can know for sure. He says, the certainty of victory over sin. So verse, in verse 18, he says, we know that no one who is born of God sins. But he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. He says the certainty of victory over sin. And, you know, as you read through the, the book of First John, he's writing to Christians, and he's saying to them, I want you to know for certain that, I want you to know for certain that you have eternal life, that you really belong to God. And he says the way that you know that you really belong to God, number one, is that you do not persist in a life of sin. You see, there is a difference. We are all sinners before God. But there are those that are sinners that are saved by the grace of God. Those who are Christians, those who are born of God, those who have yielded their lives to Jesus Christ. Yeah, we do commit acts of sin, but scripture says those who belong to God do not persist, do not continue in a lifestyle of sin. In other words, John says sin does not dominate our lives. Sin is not a habitual practice. You see, when you come to Christ, you become a new person. You see, when you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. The Holy Spirit in you is there to produce holiness. God saved us, and Scripture calls us saints. We are the people of God, God's holy ones. 
Anyone who is associated with God is associated with holiness. Anything that is associated with God is holy. Therefore, those who come to know Christ as their Savior, Scripture calls them saints. They are the people of God. And Scripture tells us one of the ways that we know that we belong to God is that we do not persist in a lifestyle of sin. John says, you see, before you were a Christian, you know, you sinned and it did not bother you. When you give your life to Christ, sin becomes a foreign element in your life. And John says, before you became a Christian, you could use the excuse, the devil made me do it. But when you come to Christ, you cannot use that excuse anymore that the devil made me do it. Because scripture tells us that God has given us everything in order to live a holy, victorious life. That's why we must yield to the Holy Spirit. That's why scripture tells us walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Every day that I live, every day that you live, you must fight against the flesh. You must yield yourself to God. We cannot make the excuse that Satan made me do it. Because I'm a child of God, I have skipped over from death to life. I have skipped over from being a child of the devil to being a child of God. I cannot persist in a life of sin. So John says, God has given us victory over sin. Children of God are called to live holy lives. First John chapter 2 and verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not continue in sin. Children of God can trust Jesus to keep them safe. Children of God can expect protection from the devil. We belong to God. It was Billy Graham who said these words. Conversion is a revolution in the life of the individual. If you are converted, you have changed, from, you have changed your whole direction. You have turned around 180 degrees and you are going in another direction. John says, we have the certainty of victory over the evil one. Then scripture tells us, we have the certainty that we belong to God. Verse 19, we know that we are children of God. I know that I belong to God. Scripture tells the spirit of God witnesses with my spirit that I am a child of God. We saw in chapter 3 and verse 1, John makes the fantastic declaration. He says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. And he says, That is what we are. And then he says, It has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we will see him as he is. The greatest thing in the world, my friend, is knowing for sure that you are a child of God. The day that you yield your life to Jesus Christ, you became a child of God. And scripture says we are born of God and eternal life is forever. I am a child of God. The certainty that we belong to God. And then number five, and finally, the certainty that Jesus is the true God. Look at verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, and in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. John says, all through First John, he says, Jesus has come in the flesh. He says, Jesus is the only begotten son of God. He says, Jesus is the only way of salvation. The certainty that Jesus is the true one. He takes a lot of time and he talks about the person of Jesus. 
the one who came from God, 100% God, 100% man, at the same time, the God-man who came and gave his life as a substitute for us on the cross of Calvary. And then scripture tells us on the third day, he rose from the dead in glorious victory. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He's the one that stands there and represents us before God. And John says, we know for certain that this Jesus is true. This Jesus is the God-man. And then in the last verse, he says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Guard yourself from idols. John says, you are serving God. Jesus is your savior. God wants our complete allegiance. God does not want anything in our lives that prevents us from truly devoting ourselves completely to him. Idolatry, my friend, is anything you love, enjoy, and pursue more than God, more than Christ, who is the true eternal life. And John says, keep away from all kinds of idols. You see, back then they had literal idols. Now we, <coughs> excuse me, we do not bow to any graven image. But my friend, anything that is you put ahead of God becomes an idol. It can be the God of sex. It can be the God of pleasure. It can be the God of materialism. You see, God wants our complete allegiance. God wants to be number one in your life. God wants to be the one calling the shots in your life. You and I have been placed upon this earth to live a life that is pleasing to him. When we come to know Christ as our Savior, we come under new management. We now belong to him. And God expects us to live the kind of life that reflects our position, that reflects our status. Our status is we belong to the king. So scripture says, let your, light, let your light so shine before men, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Scripture tells us in the midst of a dark world, we are the light of the world. Scripture tells us that we are the salt of the earth. And my friend, if we are going to get people from the side of Satan to the side of God, it's important that we live the kind of authentic life every day. We live the kind of life that brings honor and glory to God. Some preachers said the other day, if you went to the airport, you can see the difference between those who have confirmed reservation and those who are on standby. Those who have confirmed reservation, they sit down, they are relaxed, probably they are playing on their computer, they are just there waiting for whenever the flight attendant calls or whenever they call and say it's time to board, they are just relaxed, confident that they are going somewhere. Those who do not have a confirmed reservation, those who are on standby, they cannot sit down. You see them back and forth, back and forth to the ticket counter, hoping that they'll get a, there will be an extra seat so that they can get upon that flight. They are unsettled, uncertain. They want to go somewhere. They wish to go somewhere, but they are not sure. It all depends on whether there is room left on the flight. John says, you don't have to live a life of uncertainty. You don't have to live in a time of doubt in the midst of all what's going on. John says, you can know for certain that you have eternal life, that you are a child of God, and live your life in the confidence of knowing what God has revealed to us in his word. I thank you so much for being with us these last several months in the book of 1 John. 
And as I began the sermon asking you those two questions, I'll ask you again, do you know for sure that you have eternal life? My friend, the scripture says, God says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will open up the door, I will come in and sup with him. God invites you to a relationship with him. It's not about religion, my friend. It's not even about going to church. It's about a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. If you have never done so, I pray that today you will. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we've spent in the book of 1 John. Thank you for so much you have taught us. I pray, O oh God, that your people would be solidified in their faith. And for those who do not know you, I pray that they would come to know you before it's too late. We thank you so much for your word. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us on this important journey. I pray that God would continue to strengthen you in your faith as you continue to seek him with all your life. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful day.